Shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, world changers. Tonight is going to be an awesome night because we're going to be talking about uh, some really interesting scriptures. One of the highlights of tonight will be talking about Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 is a biggie because, you know, that's uh, that's one of the passages, that's one of the main verses in, in, in Christianity today. And so we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be breaking it down. Uh, we're going to be going into the Hebrew. We're going to be talking about all the application of that verse and all kinds of stuff like that. So buckle your seat belts and get ready. It's going to be an awesome, awesome evening. Now, I know some of you are listening on the other side of the world, right? Um, and so for you, it'd be an awesome, awesome morning, maybe, or day, whatever the case is. It is going to be awesome. So before I, just before I get into the chat, I'm going to get into the live chat in just a, just a second here. But um, if any of you know of any Christians that would be open to listen to what we have to say, especially about Isaiah 9, 6. Now, before I, you know what, uh, I was going to, I'm, I'm going to give you just a, uh, let's read that first. Um Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a hint of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Isaiah 9, 6 is, is the passage that unto us a child is born, unto us a son, of, unto us a son is given. Um, and, you know, his name will be called Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Counselor. You know, the government will be on his shoulders. All that kind of thing is in that verse. So once again... If you know of anybody that would be interested, if you, if you know, Christians who are not open to think a little bit out, just a little bit outside the box, wouldn't be open to what we have to say. But um, anybody that would be interested in looking at this verse, perhaps a little bit, uh, digging into it, digging into it a little bit deeper than you've ever d dug into it before. Um, I'm trying to pull this thing up here. It's being really slow. But you guys know what verse it is. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This is a verse that is used uh, in many different contexts within the Christian world. It is used uh, in, in the context of Christmas. You know, for unto us a child is born. It's used in the context of the Trinity. You know, his name shall be called Mighty God. It is one of the top verses in Christianity, and we are going to be talking about that verse. We're, I'm going to be bringing it up, and we're going to be saying things about it. I mean, right from the Hebrew, right from your own Bibles, things that most many translations will not tell you. We're going to get into that, and things that you've not heard before. You've never heard your pastor say what we're going to say tonight about Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and trust me I'm not going to I'm not going to just say it I'm going to show you guys I'm going to show you something that will just rock your world okay if you don't know it already if you don't know it already I'm going to show you something that will just rock your world so for some reason my computer here is being very slow so uh in the meantime I'll just go through the Live chat, see what we have here. We have one John says, Shalom. Shalom, brother. Good to see you. Colomento says, Shalom. It is slow, as I said. I don't know what's going on here. For some reason, it seems like it's kind of locked up on me. Um, yeah. In the meantime, Pops Remnant says, Shalom, brother, on TikTok, shalom, shalom, good to see you. And for those of you who are listening in different in various places throughout the cyberspace, uh, shalom and welcome to you guys. Now, I hope this thing is going to is not going to be. <laughs> wow, did that ever uh, was that ever slow? Okay, I hope this thing. I was just going to say, I hope this thing doesn't crash on me. Okay, so Psalm ninety four says shalom, everyone. Uh, Colomento says shalom, everyone. Vida says. Again, it's being super slow, so please, I'm sorry about this. 
Anyways, guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. Blessings multiplied to you. Great to see you all here. Again, shoot out some messages if you want to. If you if if God has put anybody on your heart or your mind uh, to share this live stream, please do so. Uh, it is going to be uh, a monumental live stream, that's for sure. And for some reason, we've got some technical issues here. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I got some. All right, the computer wants me just to shut down completely. Completely. So, anyways, um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna wait here for a minute. So I can't. I'm sorry, I can't. Re oh, there we are. <laughs> there we are. Vita says shalom all. Shalom Vita. Good to see you. Vita says, can you please pray for me and my daughter for protection? Yes, I will. Let's do that right now. Uh, we take prayer requests very seriously, and we want to jump on it uh, as, as soon as possible. So every believer within the sound of my voice, we have Vita over there on YouTube, and she is asking for prayer, for protection for herself and her daughter. So let's do this. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Father, for, for this day. We thank you, Father, for this evening. We thank you, Father, for another day that you've brought us. Father, we come before your courts with thanksgiving. We come before you with praise. You are holy. You are the great and awesome God. You who keep your covenant of love with those who love you and those who follow your commands. Father, dispatch your angels right now to Vida and to her precious daughter. Dispatch your angels to watch over them, to protect them. Father, by your presence, by your power, by the angels of heaven, open their eyes, even if you will, at least open their eyes of their understanding in their spirit, in the spiritual realm to see that there are more with them than, than with the enemy, that there are, that God has them protected. Father, we just, we just, we just say, let your protection, let the hedge of protection be put up around Vida and her daughter, her entire household, her home, everything that she has. In the name of Yeshua of Nazareth. In the name of Yeshua of Nazareth. Amen and amen. And everyone said, amen. All right. Vinny from Australia, of course, we have, says, Shalom, everyone. And he's greeting one John. Shalom, Vinny, good to see you. The Tower Time says, Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving this beautiful and anointing gift of, of music to our sister Hannah. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you, Hannah. And praise God for, uh, if you guys um, don't know, if you have anybody that's new, you know, with us tonight, especially over there on YouTube. I'm, I'm sorry I, I wasn't able to share with, with you guys on TikTok, but um, our sister Hannah has been playing and uh, blessing blessing the Lord, blessing us with her talent. And this is live music every single night. It's not recorded. It's not pre-recorded. It is live music every single night. And uh, she's just more or less prophesying on, on the keyboard because... Um, she can't really, you know, because of copyright restrictions, she can't really play, um, some, you know, lots of different music she can't play because of copyright, uh, uh, restrictions. So, um, I asked her just to go on there and just go with the flow and basically, you know, uh, just let, let the music come to you. And, and that's what has been happening. So, uh, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father, as the Tower of Time says, for giving this beautiful and anointing gift of music to our sister Hannah. I pray that she feels your presence with every key she plays in Yeshua's name. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Amen. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Tower of Time, and blessings and shalom to you as well. Um, the Great Deception says, shalom, everyone. Shalom, shalom. Uh, Zyra, Zyra says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom. Uh, 
And it's our time. It says, please also send prayers in Yeshua's name for a speedy recovery for my son's broken collarbone. Whoa. During football practice. Okay. I'm still thankful to our Heavenly Father because it could have been much worse. Wow. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry to hear about... Uh, about that, but yes, let's do that. We'll enter into prayer for your son uh, right away. So, Father, once again, Father, you are the great and awesome God. You are awesome. You are holy. You are just. You are merciful. You are about abounding in mercy and love for those who seek you, to those who fear you to those who call upon your name. So, Father, we call upon you. And, Father, we we ask you that your mercy would be poured out here. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, uh, that, uh, that it wasn't as bad as it could have been. But, Father, we ask you for a speedy recovery. We ask you, Father, for healing, even supernatural healing, uh, even a supernatural speedy recovery. Uh, healing that it would heal faster than than any of the doctors would have ever uh, thought possible and that the pain would be would be gone and uh, and that your mercy and your grace would be evident in this situation have mercy upon the tower time son in the name of Yeshua of Nazareth and father we ask you that you also send your angels and and protect him as well from here on forward. Protect him and the tower time as well. Um, let your protection be around them from here on in forevermore. In the name of Yeshua of Nazareth, everyone said amen and amen. All right, all right. Great deception, amen, yes. Vita says, uh, amen. Thank you, sir. And all, well, you're welcome. Thank you for your fellowship and thank you for your prayer requests. Caballero says, shalom, shalom, brother. Good to see you. Welcome. Blessings multiplied to you. Jamie says, I got hit by a semi truck on the highway last month. Wow. Hmm. I don't, yeah, that's, I hope, uh, hope you're okay there, Jamie. The Tower Times says, um, hallelujah, amen, amen, yes, amen. All right, all right. So, once again, uh, we are reading, we're going to be reading, for, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start reading from Second Chronicles 27, because that's on the schedule. Um, I'm going to go into Isaiah. Um, you know what? I know it says on the on the title, Second Chronicles twenty seven, Isaiah nine through twelve, and Micah one. Excuse me, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to do Second Chronicles twenty seven first, then I'll do Micah one, and then I'll do Isaiah nine through twelve. Um, there seems to be more. It, typically, there are more people uh, listening a little bit later, and that'll give you guys a little bit more time too, if you're so led to. Uh, share this and uh, and let and, you know let uh, let your uh, friends or family know about this. Just to uh, give you a heads up, um, we're going to be reading lots of different scripture here. Of course, we got uh, is it? we got set six different chapters we're reading tonight. So we got lots to cover, lots of good stuff. One thing I'm going to I'm I'm really going to be honing in on, and that is Isaiah chapter nine verse six. Got lots to say about that. I got I got, I'm sure I got comments uh, commentary about other things as well. But just as a little bit of a, a preview of what I'm going to be reading, in case some somebody doesn't, or you know, if you're not really familiar with this verse, um. So a little bit later tonight, a little bit later, I'm going to get into Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Okay, uh, so we're going to get into talking about that. And I 
pretty I'm pretty sure what I'm about to show you guys. I'm not gonna, I'm not just going to say it. I'm going to show you guys. What I'm about to show you is going to be revolutionary to you unless you it, perhaps there might be a few of you that already know what I'm um, about to about to say. But um I haven't said it yet actually. What I, what I'm about to share in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 I've never shared yet on any video, any live stream. Uh, I mean, at least at least some of it. Okay, I will. Some of it I already have talked about, but there is some that I have never said before. So uh, unless you've heard it from a different source or you've done your own studies, this is going to be new to you guys. First of all, let's read a couple chapters. Second Chronicles 27. And after that, we'll do Micah chapter one. Second Chronicles 27. OK, so verse one. Yotam or Yotham was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Yerusha, the daughter of Sadok. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Uzziah had done. However, he did not enter the temple of the Lord, but the people continued acting corruptly. He, he built the upper gate in the house of the Lord, and he built the wall of Ophel extensively. Moreover, he built cities in the hill country of Judah. He built fortresses and towers on, on the wooded hill. He fought with the king of the Ammonites and prevailed over them so that during that year, the Ammonites gave him a talent, a hundred talents of silver, excuse me, and 10,000 cores of wheat and 10,000 of barley. Now, there's a footnote here. Uh, that's about 77,000 cubic feet or about 2,180 cubic meters. The Ammonites also paid him this, this amount in the second year and in the third. So, Yotham became powerful because he directed his ways before the Lord his God. Now, the rest of the acts of Yotham all his wars and his ways, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for for 16 years. And Yotham lay down with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And his son Ahaz, or Ahaz became king in his place. Okay, so let's go over to Micah again. If you're wondering why we're kind of skipping around here, we are we are reading the scriptures in a loosely chronological order here. Okay, so, and you notice here, right, in the first verse, it talks about in the days of Yotham, right, and Ahaz, you know, so this is loosely a chronological order that we're reading it in. And it's so, uh, so good, you know, I, I recommend that everybody reads the scriptures in chronological order. It helps put things into perspective. Micah chapter 1, verse 1, the word of the Lord, which came to Micah of Moreshet, or Moreseth, in the days of Yotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, or in his, uh, the Hebrew way of pronouncing it, it'd be Hezekiahu, Hezekiahu, kings of Judah, and which he saw regarding Samaria and Jerusalem. Here, you pe- hear you peoples, all of you, listen carefully, earth and all it contains, and may the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place, and he will come down and tread on the high places of the earth, and the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will be split like wax before the fire, like water poured down a steep place. All this is due to the wrongdoing of Jacob and the sins of the house of Israel. What is the wrongdoing of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? For I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the open country, planting planting places for a vineyard. I will hurl her stones down into the valley. I will bear her foundations. All of her idols will be crushed. All of her earnings will be burned with fire. And all of her images I will make desolate. 
for she collected them from a prostitute's earnings, and to the earnings of a prostitute they will return. Because of this, I must mourn and wail. I must go barefoot and naked. I must do mourning like the jackals, and mourning like the ostriches. For wound is incurable, for it has come to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Do not tell it in Gath. Do not weep at all at Beit Le'afra. Roll yourself in the dust of mourning. So Beit Beit Le'afra, in the footnotes, it says the house of dust. It was literally, uh, you know, the word Beit in Hebrew means house of dust. Okay, Afra. The house of dust, roll yourself in the dust of mourning. Go on your way, inhabitants of Shafir. Shafir. Pleasantness. Pleasantness. In shameful nakedness. The inhabitants of Za'anan does not escape. Za'anan literally means going out. Keep in mind. Now, let me just let me just say this now. Um names especially in the in the bible now i think it mean i think names all everywhere uh is very very significant names everywhere is very very when you call somebody something i mean as it says in 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 the scriptures right that the uh the power of life and death is in the tongue right so you're calling abraham abraham the father of many nations even though he had no 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 children at all um you're calling Jacob, Jacob, the one who grasps the heel, the one who supplants, the one who takes the place of the other, which he did. He, he, he supplanted and, and took the birthright of Esau and so on and so forth. We, we talk about this quite often, actually. You, you see it so often in the scriptures. The names of these people are fulfilled in, the, in through them, actually. Right? Elijah means uh, Yah is God, right? So um, the pinnacle, the, the the climax, if you will, the 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 in the height of his ministry uh, as a prophet, he was on Mount Carmel. Let let everyone know that you are God. Okay, it was the fulfillment of his name, the fulfillment of his name, and so you see this all the way through the scriptures. So. I'm saying this right now because when we get to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, will be very shortly, actually, um, because we got all these names. We got all these names in Isaiah 9, 6. One of the most famous of all Christian verses, of all the verses that Christianity uses, I should say. So we're going to talk about this. Names. Okay? So, um, it's, it's very interesting to look up these names. Go on your way, inhabitants of Shafir in Shebo Nakin, so that's pleasantness. The inhabitant of Za'anan does not escape. Again, Za'anan means um, going out. So basically God says you are the inhabitant of the place that's called going out, but you will not escape. Just in the same way, like you are the inhabitant of some of a place called pleasantness, but you you will you will experience shameful nakedness. Uh, the mourning of the mourning of Beit Azel, Beit Azel means the house beside. Quote: He will take from you its support. Okay, its support, standing place. For the inhabitants of Maroth, Maroth, uh, in the Hebrew, bitterness, Mara, Maroth, uh, bitternesses, I suppose you would, you could even say that in the plural. In, for the inhabitant of bitterness waits for something good because a disaster has come down from the Lord to, to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the chariot to the team of horses, you inhabitant of Lachish. She was in the beginning. She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, because in you were found the rebellious acts of Israel. Therefore, you will give parting gifts in behalf of Moreshet Gath. 
The houses of Achzib will become a deception to the kings of Israel. Moreover, I will bring on you the one who takes possession, you inhabitant of Mara, uh, Mar, Marasha. Uh, the glory of Israel will enter Adullam. Shave yourself bald. Yes, cut off your hair because of the children of your delights. Extend your baldness like, an, like the eagle for they will go from you into exile. Okay, now, um, just a quick little interlude here. We have Tori. Tori says, Shalom, Shalom, Tori, good to see you. All right, so um, here we are. We're going to get into Isaiah chapter 9. Now, again, for those of you who are listening, if you're just if you're new to this, if you're if you're new to this live stream, welcome, welcome, welcome. Blessings multiplied to you, and I pray that God would expand your understanding, your knowledge of the scriptures and of his ways and of the kingdom. So let's read this again. This is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and I'm going to break this down in a way that you've never, probably never, ever heard. So again, okay, buckle your seatbelts, get ready. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Uh, this is what we're going to read. I'm going to read the first few verses, but, um, you know, the very famous verse, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Okay, let's just let's just read this. Let's just take it from verse one. And when we get to verse six, we'll, we'll do a, we'll break it down. Um, Isaiah chapter nine, verse one. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the, and not increased the joy. They joy before thee, according to the joy in the harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I'll read the next verse and then we'll do this. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Okay. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Let's go into the Blue Letter Bible to pull out the interlinear. Okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work from the traditional King James here just for the sake of those who know it very well from King James. Okay. So, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, first of all, let's check this out in the different Bibles. Different Bible translations. Okay, we got Houston, we have a problem here. We got it. Uh, let me see now. What is... Let's do this now. I'm going to have to refresh the page for some reason. Okay, so 
for some reason tonight, we are having a little bit of technical difficulties. In the meantime, let's see if we can get uh, Safaria on that. Safaria, for those of you who don't know, uh, uses several different translations, one of which is the Jewish Publication Society. Very interesting translation. Uh, right. And, you know, I, I I respect the JPS as well because, I mean, it's from um, it's from the uh, it's from our wonderful brothers and sisters in the Jewish world. Okay. Well, we got a problem. What's going on here? What's going on here? Okay. Let me try this again. I'm not sure what the problem is. Um... Okay, just give me a, okay. Um, so I'm just frozen up, okay. And finally, 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 we got something working here. Okay, so my apologies. This is beyond my, <laughs> this is beyond my control here. Um, in the meantime, you know, maybe what should I do here while I'm waiting for that? Uh, I will go through some of your chat here. Chantel, good to see you. Welcome. Blessings to you over there on TikTok. We got, uh, Rabbi Adam over there as well. Blessings. And we got Yitzhak says, Shalom, Shalom. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Okay, uh, so I am I'm on I'm live on YouTube right now, trying to sh do a screen share, and there is some technical difficulties going on here. Um, so Chantel says, "How exciting!" Yes, very exciting. Tammy says, "There is." There we are. Shalom all. Wi-Fi is struggling, tech coming in three days, so I might in and out. Hmm. Seems like there's more than one person with a little bit of technical difficulties there. And welcome, Tammy, as well. Shalom. Okay. Yeah, I got some, yeah, something is, something's up. It is, it's being, it's being disobedient. It's being disobedient. Welcome over there on Podbean. Thank you for, thank you. Um, it's good evening from Ghana. Ghana, welcome, welcome. This is the first time coming to your program. Well, welcome. Blessings, blessings. Okay, so we're doing Isaiah chapter 9, 9 verse 6. Okay, finally. Um, thank you for your patience, guys. So let's just, we'll begin by comparing some of the Bible translations here because you'll see some differences, okay? Um of course, we all know the King James, the New King James is very much, very, very similar. So I'm not going to read that. Um, the NLT, okay, the, pretty much, very much the same as well, except it says here that in some places it would, well, it could be wonderful comma counselor instead of wonderful counselor. Uh, NIV, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
uh, ESV for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will, shall be upon his shoulder or is upon. Now this is this is awesome. Uh, this is awesome. This is what I was just going to say. This is one of the things I was just going to point out. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So it says, or is upon his shoulder and his name, instead of shall be called, is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now this is, this, you might think, well, you might say to yourself, well, what's this, what's the significance of behind uh, shall be called or is called or shall be upon versus is upon? We'll get to that in just a moment. It is, it does, it does change things. Um, so just skimming over here, NASB and the government will rest on his shoulders. It says literally be on his shoulders. Okay. And that's, that's part of what I'm about to show you guys. Um, and again, in the NASB five, the same thing, literally be not will, not will rest on his shoulders, but be upon his shoulders. The NET has got it differently as well. For, for, a, for a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, his shoulders responsibly is, an, excuse me, his shoulders responsibility and is called, there it is again. We have the difference here. It's, it's quite a bit of difference between past tense or present tense and future tense. Okay. Uh, the the young Young's literal translation also has got it in the uh, present tense. For unto us a child, for un, for a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, and princely power is on his shoulder, and he does d d doth <laughs> uh, call his name. It doesn't say he his name shall be called. It's his name is called basically. Okay. Same with the Darby translation as well. And the government, uh, you know what, they kind of mixed it up here. Uh, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be. That's, uh, again, that's in the future tense. It actually should not be. And his name is called. Okay. So that's in the present tense. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you see what I'm, I'm I'm trying what I'm showing you guys right now is that there is a difference between the translations of the tense that this is in in the King James and in many of the, many of the uh, other Bibles it is in um, future tense it shall be you know the the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called versus is called okay now that's significant because. If you look into it, like some of these names or some of this, um, some of this Hebrew. Now we have uh, Rabbi Adam over there. I'm pretty sure, Rabbi Adam, you might be able to uh, confirm this. And same with, I'm not sure if Yitzhak is still there or not. But um, in the Hebrew, in this verse, when it says the government shall be, Okay, this particular Hebrew word is not in future tense. It is in perfect tense. It has already happened, and it and it's it's there now, kind of thing. And you know, it's it's a continuous thing. It's in it's not in past tense. It's not in uh, future tense. It's in perfect tense. Now, same with the um, the Hebrew word that's translated shall be called wonderful counselor, right? Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, so on and so forth. So that Hebrew word is in perfect tense. It's not in future tense. Why they translate it shall be called? 
Now, in to many Jews, they believe that uh, <laughs> a lot of Jews say, "Well, you see, this this is a um, uh, Christians uh, have tampered with this. They have not translated it properly to make it to make it more make it sound like." To really project it on Yeshua, to really project it on Jesus. They said his name shall be called. When it really says in the Hebrew, his name is called, or in perfect tense, right? It has happened. Right. Um, same with shall be the government shall be upon his shoulder. So if you look at um any other place in the scriptures that has that particular tense of the Hebrew word. It's always translated as was, was, like present tense, not future tense, not shall be. Okay, so that's that's a huge, that's a huge thing. Um now, just so you know, I'm not just making this up. I'll show you guys over there on YouTube. Um so the government shall be upon his shoulders. If you go to the actual reference here in the Hebrew, it says, was, come to pass, came, has been, were happened, become, pertained. Okay, so you see how um, it, it is translated here. And especially if you look it up in in the actual tense that is used in that in that particular uh, in that particular uh, verse, in the, in Isaiah chapter nine verse six, not just the word itself in the Hebrew, but the actual Hebrew tense that's used for that you know for that word, the Hebrew, um, and so also his name shall be called. Um, if you look that up in the Hebrew as well, again, you, you got to look at the actual tense of the word, not just, uh, you don't just look up the strongs, but actually, uh, look up the tense of the word. Now I'm, I'm getting, excuse me, I am getting more technical problems here. Things are starting to, uh, lock up a little bit here again, so. Hope it's going to be okay for the rest of the night. Um, so what I can do, let me see. Okay. Chantel on YouTube says, Shalom, it's good to be here today. I come to, to pray for those who need prayer and seeking truth. I send my love. Wow, awesome, Chantel. And blessings. You are a blessing. And blessings multiplied to you as well. That's, that's wonderful. Um, so the word that's used for his name shall be called. Okay. In the Hebrew, it's it means to call, cried, read or read, proclaim, named. You see how it's like past tense, okay? Past tense, and so it's it's important to, to understand that uh, because many people uh, understand understand this, especially in the Jewish world, understand this to be talking about something that already has happened. Not something that will happen. Although, again, to give, you know, we say you can say Yeshua is, uh, you know, everything that has happened can be reflected, you know, is is a reflection of Yeshua. You, you, you know, one could argue that. However, to take this verse at at face value, um, 
it doesn't say shall be on his shoulder. It doesn't say, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. It says his name is, or his name is called Wonderful Counselor, and the government is on, on his shoulder, okay? So it's not talking about something that will happen. It's talking about something that already has happened. It's important to know that because it's important to understand that the King James translators definitely did a little bit of trickery here. <laughs> they did a little bit of, they did some things that they uh, they probably should not have done. Uh, you know, put it in past tense when it, or put it in future tense, excuse me, as if that's what it says in the original text when it doesn't. Okay. Um. Okay, so his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So um, let's read that, Isaiah chapter 9, in the Septuagint before I break it down even more. This is something that every single Christian out there, every believer should be aware of. Okay, remember that in the, Sept the Septuagint was used by, by the early Christian church more than the uh, Hebrew, okay? The Septuagint, that was the going thing, okay? Like, just like how maybe like, you know, 50 years ago, okay? The King James was like the Bible to go by, right? You know, except for some people probably, you know, you know what I mean? Like for the, in the past 400 years, you know, approximately, the King James Bible was one of the most, one of the most read and quoted and, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, spoken of all translations up until more recent years when we have these other newer translations come out. And in the same way, in the early centuries in the Christian church, the Septuagint was very much the same way. It was like, it was the going thing. It was the going translation uh, in amongst the, the early church. Very important to understand that. Um, so Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Now this is the Brenton translation of the Septuagint. It says, for, un, for a child is born to us, and a son is given to us, whose government is upon his shoulder. So they got that right, okay? And his name is called, so they got that right, see that? The messenger of great counsel. Oh, see how different that is? As opposed to wonderful counselor, the mighty God. Messenger of great counsel, for I will bring peace upon the princes and health to him. Period. See how different that is from the Masoretic text. You, you, there's no doubt. There's, uh, there's, there's, it's no wonder that a lot of the Jewish people are very, very upset with the Christian world for doing what they did to their text, their Hebrew text, in how they have, for lack of a better word, I mean, tampered with it. I, I, I can't really think of a better word other than that. It was tampered with, changed, even the tense was changed, okay? Let alone a lot of the other things were changed. So... Again, keep in mind, please understand, Isaiah chapter 9 in the Septuagint, this would have been more like what the early Christian church would have been reading. Okay? For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, whose government is upon his shoulder. His name is called a messenger of great counsel, for I will bring peace upon the princes and health to him. So, To bring it into more perspective, this is Isaiah speaking in the present tense, talking about someone who is alive presently in his day. And you see how the church, well, I, I don't know if I, if I should blame the church or the translators on this one, probably the translators um, influenced by the church. But you see how it was changed so much. Now, I haven't finished talking about this verse yet. There's other things to talk about it. You see how much it was changed. So it was changed from wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Or I should say, 
really, it should say something like the messenger of great counsel, for I will bring pre- peace upon the princess and health to him, period. Right. This is the more ancient translation. This is the, this, the Septuagint is way, way older than the Hebrew text that we have that um, that the King James and NIV and all these, uh, many of the other transla- English translations have been translated from. So if age means means something to you, if, if, uh, if an older translation means probably a more pure translation, then the Septuagint is the way to go. His name is called Messenger of Great Counsel. For I will bring peace upon the princes and health to him. Okay. So, all right. Um, Here's another thing. Mighty God. Okay. So, in the Hebrew, we have the mighty God. Uh, The word mighty would have been great. uh, No, excuse me. In the... Uh, this thing is giving me troubles again. Uh, but anyway, the in the Hebrew, God is translated from the Hebrew word El. El, not Elohim here, but just simply El. Now, if you look it up in the Hebrew lexicon, I'm not talking about Strong's. I'm not. I don't think Strong's will take you that deep. But if you look at if you look it up in the Hebrew lexicon. Other places in the scriptures where it uses that Hebrew word, you will see that that Hebrew word was used to describe Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar was called El. Which, (laughs) okay, so I'm trying to make this as simple as possible, but it's, it's not because of the way it's been so mangled and and uh, and butchered, okay, by these translators. So Christians typically use this Isaiah chapter nine verse six to prove, you know, that they say that Jesus is God. It says he his name shall be called the mighty God. Well, be consistent here, okay? If that means that Jesus is God because he was called L. God, then you must say that Nebuchadnezzar is God too, because it says in the book of Daniel that that, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is God. El is what it says. Now, for those of you who are more well-versed in the Hebrew, you know that the word El um, means... I'm sorry, I'm just seeing... (laughs) Um, we got Rabbi Adam over on TikTok. I'm not sure. I don't think Adam is still with us. Uh, if you are, Adam, let me know. But uh, he put here um, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 5 in my Bible, which is the Hebrew Bible. That should be, um, you, everybody should know that as well. If you're talking to anybody with a Hebrew Bible or a Jewish Bible, it is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 5. So what happened was in Christian Bibles, they have split up. I think it's verse one. They split up verse one um, into two verses. So therefore, they pu- it pushed all the rest of the verses down one notch, basically. So what is Isaiah chapter nine, verse five in the Hebrew Bibles is actually Isaiah chapter nine, verse six in the Christian Bibles. Okay. Um, and and uh, Rabbi Adam says, but it doesn't say wonderful counselor, wonderful counselor in the Hebrew. Thank you, Rabbi Adam, although I think you're probably gone by now, but thank you. And that's exactly what we're getting at. It doesn't say wonderful counselor in the, in the Hebrew. And one could even argue it doesn't say mighty God in the Hebrew either. If it does, then you should, you should use the same, uh, again, being consistent here. We got to be consistent. So, okay, I got this thing running here again. I got to just kind of, I got to work with this machine here. It's getting kind of disobedient to me. Okay, so this is the interlinear breakdown of uh, of the text. 
Okay. So wonderful counselor, the mighty God, L, right? L. Okay. So again, if you look it up in, in, uh, you look up the Hebrew, and I hope it's going to be good this time. Please go on over to the Hebrew there. You will see. I'm not sure why it is like this. Oh, here we are. Okay. And you go skip, skip the, skip the strong. Sometimes strongs is good. Sometimes it's not all that great. Um, but you go down here um, to Justinius's Hebrew Chaldee lexicon. Okay. It says that the word L means strong, mighty, a mighty one, or just simply a hero. Okay. Now keep in mind it's translated God in Isaiah 9 6. Uh, in the singular, that is El instead of Elohim, uh, Ezekiel 31 11, the mighty one of the nations used of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sorry, I said it was Daniel, uh, but it was Ezekiel chapter 31 verse 11 that, 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 that's, that calls Nebuchadnezzar the mighty one of the nations, the El of the nations. So, if this thing can be a little bit uh, good with us here, um, let's let's try to go on over there. Um, Blue Letter Bible, okay? And we'll go to Isaiah, Ezekiel chapter 31, verse 11. Oh, it is. Okay. So, I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen, he shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. So the mighty one of the heathen, as it says in the lexicon, that's referring to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. In the interlinear, it is a variation. It's a, the L, okay. The mighty one of the heathen. Okay. So it's just, it's, it's a little bit, yeah, it is the Hebrew word L, just a little bit of a variation there. Uh, however, as we have seen uh, that uh, it says here that this same word L is what is used here in Ezekiel chapter 31, verse 11, the mighty one of the heathens or of the, of the nations uh, used of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, so it mentions the Septuagint as well. Let's just go quickly run out over to the Septuagint to see what we have over there for Ezekiel 31, verse 11. Therefore I delivered him into the hands of the prince of the nations, and he wrought his destruction. So this word prince would be the, the word that's translated from L. Okay, so again, to be consistent, we should be consistent here. Um, the word that's translated uh, God, as in mighty God, uh, is L, which means prince or hero, mighty one. It can be even used of someone like Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So, um, finally, I do want to, uh, is, you know what, let, let me just go on over to, before I say, before I give the final point here, let's just go on over to uh, Safaria, Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, again, it's kind of slow here. Isaiah chapter 9. Now, it should be verse 5 here, because this this is a, Hebrew is from the Hebrew. It's a Jewish Bible, so it should be on verse five. Uh, again, we're, we're going a little bit slow here. I'm not sure what the problem is, but let me see what we got here in the comments. Great Deception says, what about Isaiah 9, 7 and his rule shall... Uh, of his rule, there shall be no end. Is no end with no end. Uh, yeah, we'll get we'll we'll uh, we'll check that out. Very good. Thank you for 
for directing our attention to the next verse. It's definitely important. The Tower of Time says the uh, Brother O'Neill has a different take on these verses. Yes, I, I did speak to him before about this. It's very interesting. Um, and so I believe that that would still be up on our replay there before when we had him on and he did, he did speak upon, about this verse as well. Um, yeah, so, um, all right. So now we got this up finally, this is. In Safaria, this is verse 5, by the way. For a child has been born to us. A son has been given to us. And authority has settled on his shoulders. His, he has been named the mighty God of planning grace. That's different, isn't it? Uh, as in 25 verse 1. Okay, so Isaiah 25 verse 1. The eternal father, a peaceable ruler... In token of abundant authority and of peace without limit upon David's throne and kingdom, that it may be firmly established in justice and in equity now and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall bring this to pass. Okay, so uh, very interesting. Let's just quickly take a look at something like Rashi. Um Although Ahaz or Ahaz uh, is wicked, his son, who was born to him many years ago, nine years prior to his assuming the throne, uh, to be our king in his stead shall be a righteous man, uh, and the authority of the Holy One, blessed be he, and his yoke shall be upon his shoulder, for he shall engage the, in the Torah and observe the commandments, and he shall bend his shoulder to bear the burden of the Holy One, blessed be he. The only one, blessed be he, who gives wondrous counsel, is a mighty God and an everlasting Father called Hezekiah's name, the Prince of Peace, since peace and truth will be in his days. So this is, this is the, actually, this is the next, um, this is the next point I was going to make is that it is commonly believed within the Hebrew slash Jewish world that this is talking about Hezekiah. Okay. Um, and Rashi just confirmed that. Uh, so let's see what we have here. Okay, uh, I'll, let's. I'll just quickly go through this. All this, all this has come to pass through the merit of the child that, that is born unto us. We know that. At the time of the invasion of Sennacherib, Hezekiah was 39 years old. At the time of this prophecy, he is therefore called the child. According to some, these expressions are names of God. And the following, uh, the name of the child. I think that all these words are names of the child. He is called wonder or wonderful. Because God did wonders in his days. Counseling. Uh, this is distinct, distinctly said of Hezekiah in um, see 2 Chronicles 30 verse 2. Mighty chief. Interesting, mighty chief instead of mighty God. For Hezekiah was powerful. Um, the father of perpetuity. Because the reign of the house of David was prolonged through his merits. And here, the, na uh, the same meaning as in uh, chapter 58, verse 15, Prince of Peace, because peace was established in his days. Compare with uh, 2 Chronicles 32, 22. So, um, very, very interesting. So, typically speaking, now, I'm just, again, I'm just, I'm just, I think it's very important for, for, for Christians to see every point of view. Okay. So typically speaking, the Jews strongly believe this to be speaking about Hezekiah. And you would say, well, why, why would Hezekiah be called the mighty God? 
Now, given that is the correct interpretation or the correct, you know, the manuscripts haven't been altered, you know, considering the, you know, vast difference that we have in the Septuagint, which was is much older. Um, you notice how many of these names speak of God. I said that before. Isaiah itself has the name of God in it. Yeshiyahu is his Hebrew name, which means, uh, you know, Yahu, God is our salvation. Um, God is my salvation is what it, what, is what it means. Um, Hezekiah means, or Hezekiahu means the mighty God, okay? That name means the mighty God or the mighty Lord, okay? That's what that word means or that, that name means. So, I mean, let's, let's, be, let's, let's have an open mind here and, and, and let's be consistent with this. If this is talking about Yeshua, as most modern Christians would tell you, that, you know, this is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, even though really who called Jesus Father in the, in the Bible? Uh, Prince of Peace, that's a common name for Jesus. Um, but, I mean, mighty God, if that is his name, does that mean that he is God? When Isaiah, his name is Yahu is my salvation. Does that mean that he is Yahu? Does that mean that Isaiah is God? You hear what I'm saying? I mean, you know, think with me a little bit. Hezekiah, his Yahu means the mighty God or the mighty Lord. Yahu is mighty. The mighty Yahu. That's what it's, that's what it, that's what it means. And so that's why. Most Jewish people, if not all of them, look at this. Now, if um, if Rabbi Adam was still with us, I'd be asking him about that. But um, that's why they say that that is not, I mean, that's talking about Hezekiah. By the way, uh, Rabbi Adam is a Messianic rabbi. Thank you for the likes over there on TikTok. Um, very interesting way you worded that, com that that question there. I'm a believer now. I'm a believer now. Uh, the very, inter very interesting way you worded that. Is Jesus a, or a, a Messiah? Interesting that you, you, that you didn't ask, is Jesus the Messiah? You, you asked, is Jesus a Messiah? And that brings another point to the table, and that is that there were, there were, again, to those who know the Hebrew, to those who know the Tanakh in the Hebrew, there were many messiahs. Because Messiah meant anointed. That's all it meant. So when Samuel anointed Saul, he was literally anointed. You know, he was, when, when, when David was anointed as king, he was, you know, Mashiach. Okay, he was anointed. Um, so in many, again, we're reading Jewish texts when we're reading the Hebrew. And we're reading from, a, from the scriptures that have been brought to us through the Jews. So I think it's very important to understand what they know about what you know, about their own scriptures. And that is that it's not just one Messiah that the scriptures talk about. The scriptures talk about many. So, yes, I believe Jesus as being anointed for sure. Absolutely. I do. To answer your question, I'm a believer now. Um, let me see what, what we have here in the comments before I go on. I will get to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7 there. So Tori says, uh, 1 Timothy 3.16 in the King James, says God was manifest in the flesh. And in the NASB, it is translated God who was revealed in the flesh. 
the King James translated to support the Trinity. Very interesting. And thank you for pointing that out as well. Yes. Um, a lot of people, they look at the King James as being like inspired, like everything, like the whole, like the translation is inspired, you know, when it's not, I mean, it depends on how you, how you interpret the word trans, uh, inspired. You can say, yes, it's inspired. Doesn't mean it's perfect. It's far from perfect. In far, as far as I'm concerned, it's far from perfect. Uh, it can still be in, inspired and still not be perfect. Okay. It depends on how you understand that. But, um, and then there's a couple of things about 1 Timothy 3.16 as well. Number one is, most Christians don't know this, that book is part of the, trying to find the right word here. Um, it's part of the six books of, quote unquote, Paul, that many scholars and paleographers believe was not even written by Paul. It was forged, okay? Um, so we got to take that into consideration as well. Also, what does it mean to be manifest in the flesh? Or what does it mean to be revealed in the flesh? I, I can remember hearing a Jewish rabbi saying that, um, to, that it, it's really everybody's responsibility to manifest God in the flesh. In other words, to be a reflection of the Holy One, to be a reflection of God, to let God shine through you, to let God be revealed in you, okay? So there's a lot to talk about when it comes to all this kind of stuff. Very good, uh, great deception. I mean, I didn't think about that. I, I you know, and this, I didn't think about talking about that right in, in, in this live stream, but yeah, many will come in my name saying I am anointed. Yes, Christ, and will deceive many. Oh, wow, that is amazing. It, yeah, it's an amazing revelation there because, you know, a lot of people have come and they come saying I'm anointed. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, and again, thanks for the likes over there on TikTok and on YouTube. I can't really see the likes on YouTube. For some reason, I'm sorry, but uh, if you like it, make sure you make sure you let the system know. Um, so, I think it's important to sit down and talk about these important verses, you know. And if you notice, see, a lot of people get me wrong. They they understand me wrong when I say kind of the things that I've been saying in the past half an hour or so here. What I'm doing is I'm just. What I'm doing is I'm basically, I'm just putting a puzzle, like a jigsaw puzzle pieces on the table in front of us and just saying, okay, let's, let's work this through. Let's, let's work this up. Let's, you know, we got pieces here that needs to be, we need to, we need to solve this puzzle. A lot of people don't, don't understand, you know, the, what I'm doing. And basically what I'm doing is I'm just inspiring people to meditate and to think about the scriptures to dig deeper into the meanings, to dig deeper into the manuscripts, uh, to understand it better. And for the, for the most part, what I do is I kind of leave it up to you guys. I mean, judge judge for yourself. I'm, I'm throwing out facts. I'm throwing out bit, pieces of information, evidence here, evidence there. And I'm just kind of like, hey, you guys be the judge. You guys be the judge. Uh, it's very, very important. You're not going to hear this in church. At least I've never heard this in church. In all the years I used to go to church, I never heard any of this stuff in church. So let's go to the next verse. Well, since we got Safari open right now, uh, let's do that in Safari first. In the token of abundant authority and of peace without limit upon David's throne and kingdom, that it may be be firmly established in justice and in equity now and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall bring this to pass. Okay. Um, very interesting. So let's just see what some of these commentators have to say about it. To whom will he call this name? To the king who increases the authority of, of the Holy One, oh, excuse me, of the Holy One, blessed be he upon himself to fear him. 
authority, an, ex an expression of government. This is to refute those who disagree with us, the Christians, the Christians they got here, um, that, it, that it is possible to say that Prince of Peace too is one of the names of the Holy One, blessed be he, and this calling of, the of a name is not actually a name, but an expression, a variation of, uh, for the purpose of greatness and authority. Compare Ruth chapter 4, verse 11 and be famous in Bethlehem. Also, 2 Samuel 7, 9, and 1 Chronicles uh, 17, 8, quote, and I shall make for sure, or for you, excuse me, a name, unquote. Here too, scripture means, and he, and he gave him a name of, excuse me, and he gave him a name and authority. And for peace, which is given to him, there will be no end. For he had peace on all his sides, and this end is not an expression of an end to eternity, but there will be no boundaries. On the throne of the kingdom of David shall this peace be justice and righteousness that Hezekiah performed. For peace, the Hebrew, the, this vav is to rectify the word, thus he, Hezekiah, Increased the authority upon his shoulder, and what reward will he, God, pay him? Behold, his peace shall have no end or any limit. From, uh, from now into eternity, the eternity of Hezekiah, all his days. And so we find that Hannah said concerning Samuel, 1 Samuel 1, 22, quote, and abide there forever. Unquote. And in order to refute those who disagree, i.e. the Christians who claim that this Prince of Peace is their deity, uh, we can refute them by asking, what is the meaning of from now? Is it not so that the, the quote-unquote deity did not come until after 500 years and more? The zeal of the Lord of hosts. Who was zealous for Zion concerning what Aram and Pekah planned about it? Shall accomplish this. But Ahaz does not deserve it. Moreover, the merit of the patriarchs has terminated. Addendum. And our rabbi said, the Holy One, blessed be he, wished to make Hezekiah the Messiah and Sennacherib, Gog and Magog said the ministering of angels before the Holy One, blessed be he, should the one who stripped the doors of the temple and sent them to the king of Assyria be made Messiah? Immediately scripture closed it up. Very, very interesting, isn't it? Okay, so going back to the Septuagint. Uh, so this is verse 7. I know at the top it says Ezekiel 9, but it's not. It's it's It's... Isaiah chapter 9, actually. Um, verse 7, His government shall be great, and his peace, and of his peace there is no end. It shall be upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and support it with judgment and with righteousness from henceforth and forever. The seal of, of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. Going back to... Blue Letter Bible, check out some of the Bible, uh, excuse me, I did the wrong verse there, verse 7, some of the Bible translations. So of the King James says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with just judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform perform this. Uh, pretty much the same in the New King, New King James. Um, NIV of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he shall reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Pretty much the same. Yeah. 
This is a little bit different in the CSB. Okay, so it says the dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will, will accomplish this. In ASB, there, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. In the footnotes, over David's kingdom to establish it and to withhold it, excuse me, and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. I'll just read two more. I'll read the NET and the Young, Young's Literal. Young's Literal is always pretty good. The NET says, His dominion will be vast, and he will bring an immeasurable prosperity. He will rule on David's throne and over David's kingdom, establishing it and strengthening, strengthening it by promoting justice and fairness from this time forward and forevermore. The Lord's intense devotion to his people will, will accomplish this. And, the, and Young's literal translation says, to the increase of the princely power and of peace, there is no end on the throne of David and on his kingdom to establish it and to support it in justice or in judgment and righteousness Henceforth and even unto the age, the zeal of Jehovah of hosts does this. Okay, so um, just before I get on reading the rest of it, I mean the rest of Isaiah chapter 9. Um, Give me a second here, Isaiah chapter 9. Before I read the rest of Isaiah chapter 9, I will take a peek into the comment section. So 9, 10, 11, 12 we got here. Okay, so. Kingdom Concepts says this is about Hezekiah. And the Great Deception says Hezekiah forever. Yeah, so it's very good, very good questions. And it, it really, it, it, it caused, it, it provokes a lot of thought. And that's very good. Um, you see what a lot of see what people would do if they, if they take it for what it says, they would say, I'm, I'm just I'm just speaking off the top of my head right now. Uh, they would say, OK, so this is talking about someone who has been born. In Isaiah's time, it's written in the past tense or present, excuse me, perfect tense, something that somebody who has already been born. OK, and. Somebody who is currently reigning according to um, the government is upon his shoulders. Uh, his name is called, you know. Um, so someone might say, well, what does that mean then? Was there some, was there a king in Isaiah's time that, that reigned from his time forward forever? Or what, or does it mean something else? And then, you know, Christians typically would say, you know, uh, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 are talk, is talking about Jesus. And then again, you know, so the Jews would look at that and say, well, um, we have nobody sitting on the throne of David right now. The throne of David is empty. We don't have a Messiah. That's how they would look at it. I'm, 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 just, I'm just speaking from what I believe what their point of view would be. Their point of view would be, hey, we don't have a king right now. We don't. Uh, so they, how, how do they interpret that? 
Very, very good point there, kingdom concepts. There's no reference of Isaiah 9, 6 in the New Testament. Hmm. Very, very good point. Uh, because you see, it's it's spoken of in church as if as if it is. It, it's actually read and and believed as if it's part of the New Testament, you know, the way it is. I'm just kind of let me just looking over a few things here. It's an amazing brother Pete. That's a, that's, that's a very, very good point. Very, very good point. And that point there again, goes to prove in my mind, it goes to prove these like in the new Testament, you got even Jesus, perhaps the 12 disciples for sure. Paul for sure. Uh, the, the early church fathers, for sure. I mean, they had the, the Septuagint. And reading the Septuagint for what it says does not seem to show any kind of resemblance to Yeshua. Again, let's just go there just again, just quickly. Because this, this would have been the scriptures that they would have been reading, right? Uh, verse 6, again, in the this is from the Brenton Septuagint. For a child is born, is born unto us, not will be. And a son is given to us, says Isaiah, not will be. Whose government is upon his shoulder, not will be. And his name is called messenger of great counsel, not will be. For I will bring peace upon the princes and health to him. Now, that health to him reminds me of the whole, the whole, the whole scenario with King Hezekiah, when he did get years added to his life, right? So that would fit perfectly in with Hezekiah. The Septuagint, although the Jews don't really like the Septuagint all that much. Uh, if they did, if they really did, you know, if they really did uh, put a little bit more weight on the Septuagint, they could say, hey, see? And that's to say that God will, will, will restore health to him, which that is what happened, right? It has a Kaya. And so this, Brother Pete, yeah, see, this, this is what people need to understand. They really need to understand this. Correct. Unfortunately, Christian religion purposefully, purposely uh, inserted the Trinity into Isaiah 9, 6. I was just listening to a rabbi before I went live. And this rabbi called it a crime scene. He called Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, especially in the King James and many of the other English Bibles. He, he called it he called it criminal. <laughs> he called it a crime scene. So, um, very interesting, very interesting discussion. And as always, you guys are awesome. Um, very interesting. So let's, let's, let's move on here. If you have any more questions there or comments about, oh, <laughs> great deception. You got, I can, you know, you always, this is, this is it, right? Many crimes, the lying pen of the, of the scribes, you know, Jeremiah 8, 8, uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8. Yeah, really good. Good stuff. All right. So Isaiah chapter 9, now we're on verse 8, and we'll read through to, to chapter 12. We'll read chapter 12, and then again, um, I'll get to your comments. If you have any specific one, uh, questions or if you want to ask something of me uh, specifically, just 
put at Christopher in the live chat and I, that will help me get my attention. So Isaiah chapter nine, verse eight. I'm reading from the NSB this time. The Lord sends a message against Jacob and it falls on Israel. And all the people know it. That is Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, asserting in pride and in arrogance of heart. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild the smooth stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore, the Lord raises superior adversaries against them from Razin and provokes their enemies. The Arameans from the east and the Philistines from the west, and they divide Israel with gaping jaws. Uh, gaping jaws, the whole mouth, literally the whole mouth. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away, and his hand is still stretched out. Yet the people do not turn back to him who struck them, nor did they see, nor do they seek the Lord of armies. So the Lord cuts off head and tail from Israel, both palm branch and bulrush in a single day. The head is the elder and esteemed man, and the prophet who teaches falsehood in, in the tail, or excuse me, is the, the tail, and the prophet who teaches falsehood is the tail. Interesting. The elder is the, is the head, and the prophet who teaches falsehood is the tail. For those who guide this people are leading them astray, and those who are guided by them are confused. Therefore, the Lord does not rejoice over their, their young men, nor does he have compassion on their orphans or their widows. For every one of them is godless and an evildoer, and every mouth is speaking foolishness. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away, and his, his hand is still stretched out. For wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It also sets the thickets of the forest aflame, and they roll upward in a column of smoke. But the wrath of the Lord of armies, the, excuse me, by the wrath of the Lord, Lord of armies, the land is burned, and all and the people are like fuel for the fire. No one spares his brother. They devour what is on the right hand, but are still hungry. And they eat what is on the left hand, but they are not satisfied. Each of them eats the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh, Manasseh devours Ephraim and Ephraim Manasseh. And together they are against Judah. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. Isaiah chapter 10. Woe to those who enact unjust statutes and to those who constantly record harmful decisions so as to deprive the needy of justice and rob the poor among my people of their rights so that widows may be their spoil and that they may plunder the orphans. Now what will you do in the day of punishment and in the day of devastation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your wealth? Nothing remains but to crouch among the, the captives or fall among those killed. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in, who, in whose hands is my indignation. I send it against the God, a godless nation and commission it against the people of my fury to capture spoils and to seize plunder and to trample them down like mud in the, in the streets. Yet it does not so intend, nor does it plan so in its heart, but rather it is its purpose to destroy and to eliminate many nations. For it says, are not my officers all kings? Is not Kalno, Karkimish, or Hamoth like Arpad? 
or Samaria like Damascus, as my hand has reached to the to the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not do the same to Jerusalem and her images, just as I have done to Samaria and her idols? So it will be that the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem. He will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the arrogant pride of his eyes. For he has said, quote, by the power of my hand and by the wisdom, by my wisdom, I did this because I have understanding and I removed the boundaries of the peoples and plundered their treasures. And like a powerful man, I brought down their inhabitants and my hand reached to the riches of the peoples like a nest. And as one gathers abandoned eggs, I gathered all the earth. There was not one that flawed or flapped its wing, its beak, or chirped. Unquote. Is the axe to boast itself over the one who chops it, chops with it? Is the saw to exalt itself over the one who wields it? That one would would uh, that would be like a club wielding those who lift it or like a rod lifting the one who is not wood therefore the lord the god of armies will send a wasting disease among his stout warriors Un and under his glory a fire will be kindled like a burning flame and the light of israel will become a fire and israel's holy one a flame and it will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in a single day. And he will destroy the glory of his forest and of his fruitful garden, both soul and body. And it will be as when a sick person wastes away. And the rest of the trees of his forest will be so small in number that a child could write, could write them down. Now on that day, the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped will no longer rely on the one who struck them, but will rely, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. And though your people Israel may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant in them will return. A destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. For a complete destruction, one that is determined, the Lord of God, the Lord God of armies will execute in the midst of the whole land. Therefore, this is what the Lord God of armies says. My people, you who dwell in Zion, do not fear the Assyrian who strikes you with the rod and lifts up his staff against you the way Egypt did. For in a very little while my indignation against you will be ended and my anger will be directed toward their destruction. The Lord of armies will wield a whip against him like the defeat of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And his staff will be over the sea and he will lift it up the way he did in Egypt. So it will be on that day that his burden will be removed from your shoulders and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be broken because of fatness. Now in the King James, I believe it says because of the anointing here, anointing of fatness. Verse 28, he has come against Ayatz. He has passed through Migron. At Mikmash, he deposited his baggage. They have gone through the pass, saying, Geba will be our encampment for the night. Rama is terrified, and Gibeah of Saul has fled. Cry aloud with your voice, daughter of Galim. Pay attention, La Laisha and wretched Anathoth. Madmena has fled. The inhabitants of Gebim has sought refuge. 
Yet today he will halt at Nob. He shakes his fist at the mountain of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord, the God of armies, will lop off the branches with terrifying power. Those also who are tall in stature will be brought down, and those who are lofty will be brought low. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an iron axe, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. Now, Isaiah chapter 11, the first few verses here, very, very interesting. I want to point something out to you guys. This is uh, talking about the Spirit of the Lord. Now, if you go on over to Reve- um, we got the sevenfold spirit in Revelation. Revelation, okay, where are we here? So in Revelation, as you see, there's there's several different areas where it talks. So in the footnotes, the seven spirits, okay? So Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, talks about the seven spirits before his throne. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, wait a second here. For some reason, I don't know why. Huh. Sorry about that, guys. I guess you guys, I, I just, it just, I just noticed it wasn't. Um, uh, the screen wasn't up. The tab wasn't up there. So, my apologies. Uh, so, Revelation chapter one verse four talks about the sevenfold spirit or the seven spirits. Okay. Uh, Revelation 3, 3, 1 talks about the sevenfold spirit, the Greek seven spirits, okay? Um, the seven spirits of God, that is, okay? Revelation 4, 5 talks about the seven spirits of God. Revelation 5, 6 talks about the seven spirits of God. Now, what are the seven spirits of God? The answer is found in Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11 is uh, about the seven spirits of God. I'll show you guys. So verse one, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch from it, his roots will bear fruit. Okay, so I believe this is talking about Yeshua. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Okay, so. The spirit of the Lord. Number one, the spirit of two, or excuse me, excuse me, the spirit of wisdom. Number two, the spirit of understanding. Number three, the spirit of counsel. Number four, the spirit of strength. Number five, the spirit of knowledge. Number six, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Number seven, I believe this is an enumeration of the seven spirits of God right here. This is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, okay? Once again, just to quickly go over it, the seven spirits of God, I believe this is what is the seven spirits of God are. Number one, the spirit of the Lord. Number two, the spirit of wisdom. The number three, spirit of understanding. Number four, spirit of counsel. Number five, spirit of strength. Number six, the spirit of knowledge. And number seven, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Verse three, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. That's awesome. And he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make decisions by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the humble of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt around his hips, and faithfulness the belt around his waist. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatted steer will be together. And a little boy will lead them. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Now, I do have to stop here just for a second because it is, it is important to understand as well 
that in the in the Jewish world, this is what they're looking for. When this happens, they believe they're in the Messianic age. They believe the Messiah has come. Okay, this is what they're looking for. Okay, they're looking for uh, an age of um, how do they put it? Uh, a utopia. They're looking for you know the, the utopian age. Okay. Uh, and so this is why one of the reasons why they do not they do not believe that the Messiah has come because they don't see any rest. I mean, they, they don't see what they believe that they should be seeing according to the scriptures when the Messiah comes. Um, you know, Isaiah chapter two talks about when the Messiah comes, he will rule and reign from Jerusalem using the Torah. Micah chapter four also talks about that as well. Um, so, and this as well. This this particular pitch here. Uh, and the and the wolf will will dwell with the lamb. The leopard lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatted steer will be together, and the little boy will lead them. Um, so most see so in, in the Christian world they would say this hap this will happen after Jesus comes back, right? So just so you understand the different points of view. Verse 7, this is Isaiah eleven seven. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like, an, like the ox. So I mean like a... Um, and let me just say as well, some people believe that this is not talking... This is not literal. This is all figurative. This is all... Um, symbolic okay because you see like lion eating straw like an ox i mean wouldn't that entail a complete remake of the lion's anatomy okay if it was literal if this was literal wouldn't that entail that wouldn't would that not entail a complete recreation of the of the lion's anatomy Verse 8, the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. It's interesting how it talks about in my holy mountain, which implies it doesn't mean everywhere. It implies that it doesn't mean everywhere. It's talking about just in one place here. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the, of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay, so that would that's obviously talking about the whole earth there. Then on that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal flag for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover with his hand the second time the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Athros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Islands of the sea in the footnotes, the coastlands, okay? So this could be referring to like the, the Americas, right? Could be the Americas that are... Uh, spoken of here. And he will lift up a flag for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Then the jealousy of Ephraim will depart and those who har harass Judah will be eliminated. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah and Judah will not harass Ephraim. They will swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines on the west. Together they will plunder the people of the east. They will possess Edom and Moab, and the sons of Ammon will be sucked to them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. And he will wave his hand over the Euphrates River with a scorching wind, and he will strike it into seven streams and make people walk over the in dry sandals. And there will be a highway from Assyria 
for the remnant of his people who will be left, just as there was for Israel on the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. Isaiah chapter 12. Then you will say on that day, quote, I will give thanks to you, Lord, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Unquote. There's a song, there's a song, I like, there's a song that I actually sing um, using those using those lyrics. Verse three, therefore you will joy, joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. And on that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, make them that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done glorious things. Let this this be known throughout the earth. Rejoice and shout for joy, you inhabitants of Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? That concludes our scripture reading for tonight. If you are new here, make sure you subscribe, make sure you're following, make sure you have those notifications on. We do we do go live every day, sometimes the on time, twice a day, as we did before when we had the rabbi on. We went on, we went live twice a day. I do believe we did that as well with uh, Courtney as well. Uh, so if uh, it depends on um, our guests, when we have different guests that are come on, coming on, depends on what times they are available. If they are available at off times, and we will go live on an off time, uh, as well as our regular times, by the grace of God and Lord willing. So let's see what we have here in the chat. I uh, like this. This is a good one too. Great deception with the breath of his mouth and the glory of his coming. Wow. What a wonderful day that will be. The tower time, the mil the millennial reign, then the restoration and restoration of all creation. Wow, again, that's when beautiful, beautiful times ahead. Beautiful times ahead. Well, Senior says, why not? Like, why not be in literal? Did not Yah take the lions during Daniel's account? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I just thought I'd kind of Throw, throw out, again, some more different ideas that some people have. And, you know, I know that some people take that as a figurative, figuratively speaking. But yes, God can certainly do that. Tame. Yeah. Tame. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess one of my points was this, like, it's one thing for a lion to be tame. It's another thing for him to eat some, like, like, like a cow, like a cow has a certain, uh, I mean, I'm not a vet, right? So I don't, I'm, I don't know a whole lot about the anatomy of a lion, but I don't think that a lion could eat grass like a cow and survive uh, very long. 
So they would it would need a an anatomy. It would need to have a total remake of his of its anatomy, as far as I understand. Correct me if I'm wrong, but. New Jerusalem comes down from the heavens. Yes. Going nowhere says, do you think Christians should not eat pork? Absolutely should not eat pork. Absolutely. I think that Christians should do everything they can do to obey and to to obey the the instructions of our Father that's laid out for us all the way through Scripture. We should be willing to do everything possible. Simple, plain, and simple as the Great Deception puts it: no pig, no pig. Okay, so um, yes, so this this actually concludes our our the first day of the week, right? Uh, Sunday, our Sunday reading of uh, the scriptures and our fellowship here. As always, you guys are awesome. I appreciate every one of you. Um, you guys are, are 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 just as I always say. You guys are world changers. I appreciate each one of you. You guys are awesome. So. Um, I appreciate your fellowship. I appreciate your, your comments and your questions. So, um, tomorrow, Lord willing, we will be back same time, same place. Again, if you're new, we we do this every single day by the grace of God, uh, Sunday through Friday, six days a week, 7 PM Eastern at 7 PM New York time. Uh, and on Saturdays we go live 2 PM Eastern. So that'd be 2 PM New York time. So just so you guys know, if you're new, uh, again, welcome and hopefully see you again tomorrow evening. That's tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll continue where we left off, uh, reading our reading the scriptures chronologically. The Tower Times says, thank you, Yahweh, for you and your faithful, or excuse me, thank you. Thank Yahweh for you and your faithful fellowship and you continually feeding the sheep, Brother Christopher. Well, thank you, uh, the Tower Time. Thank you for for being here. And, and uh, I mean, the Lord is, I just appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you. Blessings multiplied upon you. The Great Deception says, thank you, brother. Much love and blessings to you all. And multiplied back to you as well. Tower Time says, y'all stay blessed. You too. You too, brother. Going Nowhere says, hope you have a good night, Chris. Thank you very much. I hope you have a better night. Tammy says, Christopher, you have no idea how amazing it is that you are exposing the lies and revealing truth. I've been on the same I've been on the same path. It's not an easy one. Wow, thank you very much, Tammy. I appreciate you. Um, and I appreciate your kind and encouraging comment. Thank you. Going Nora says, I hope everyone else has a good night also. Thank you very much. Going nowhere. One John says, uh, thank you for breaking that down. I always wondered about Isaiah. Thank you again, One John. Blessings to you, brother. All right, guys. So see you tomorrow. Blessings multiplied to you guys. And uh, as always, I'll end, I'll end with uh, the blessing. As I always pray it, that the Lord bless you. I pray every one of you, everyone that's listening on every platform that we're doing this. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you and give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen. Amen. See you tomorrow.